previous song we did, not this one, but um, the one before that. Oh, wow. I'm getting old. I forgot what it was already. <laughs> anyway, we did that down there. We didn't. They did it as special music uh, down in the Caribbean. And um, it was very interesting. The second verse, they did it with a Caribbean twist. Now, I'm not going to try to do it for you because I would <laughs> probably run everybody off. But it's interesting. can't remember what the name of the song was. We just, we just did it. One faith, one, no. It'll come to me. When it does, I'll let you know. <laughs> but it was interesting how they did that. Uh, another thought just occurred to me, and I, I need to get moving on here. But a thought occurred to me, you know, next week, um, with the potluck, and then uh, we're not going to start our slideshow until after sunset, we probably, what do you think, we probably should move services back. Otherwise, we're going to be setting for an hour and a half or two hours. So, 2.30? Everybody good with 2.30? Okay. Next week, 2.30. <laughs> if you show up at 1, then you'll be here to visit for a while. And that's fine. But 2.30, that's what we'll do. <clears throat> so when you think about our life, every day that we have is a blessing from God, right? I mean, we agree with that. Every day we have is a blessing from God. Matter of fact, we agree with it because the Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us that we absolutely have no assurance that there is a tomorrow. Not for any of us. We don't know. We don't know what's going to happen when we leave here today. So the very time that we have right now in the present, this is all we have. So don't you think we should make the absolute best of it? This moment? Not tomorrow. Not the day after, but right now. That was one of the lessons that we saw <laughs> with our Caribbean brethren. They made the best of every day they had. And a lot of them, in the physical sense, as you and I know, had nothing. They had nothing. But they had God's truth. And it was extremely obvious that they had God's spirit. And it was impressive. And it really made you feel blessed to be a part of <laughs> their celebration, to be a part of their life. You and I have the very same thing. We have the very same thing. But too often, many people are just going through the motions. They're just going through the motions. We all can think back. It's been several years ago, so kind of dating myself here. But we remember the commercial from the Dunkin' Donuts. The alarm would go off at 4 o'clock in the morning. The guy would just kind of pop out of bed with his little sleeping outfit on, his pajamas, and he would kind of shuffle through, and he would mutter, time to make the donuts, time to make the donuts. And that's all he would do, just go through, and he'd go through his day. And then you would see him throughout the day, and you would have that same vision. This guy probably ought to have a fire lit under him, just a little bit. <laughs> he just muttered through the day. I kind of titled this message, I, I, I've taken it from, and most of you older people will appreciate this, I, I've taken it from 1979, 1980, I believe, REO Speedwagon song. Keep the fire burning. That's what it's called. Keep the fire burning. But we know people that it seems like they just get up every day and they just kind of muddle through the day. And you, you run across these people, and, and it kind of makes you want to reach over and pinch them to see if they're still alive or not. I mean, if, if you watch them long enough, you will fall asleep. That's, that's sad but true. I want to start with a section of Scripture in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. This is a very interesting Section scripture to look at as we get started on this topic. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, we'll start in verse 4. <clears throat> Read down through a few of these verses. 
Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no future reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now, it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days... For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever you, your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you are going, there is neither working, working nor planning, nor knowledge nor wisdom. Brothers, we have the ability to take a breath, to breathe, then guess what? We have hope. We have hope. Basically, what Solomon is saying here is that if we are alive, we've got a chance to do something very special with our life. If we are going to make a difference, then we better make it happen while we can. We better make it happen while we're able to, to breathe and get up every day. It's like what he just said here in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. People who are alive have hope. You know, we can, we can dream, we can plan, and we can have a fresh start every day. And you know, it's easy to start thinking that, well, life has passed us by. But if we're still breathing, if we're here today, guess what? We still have a shot. We still have hope. We can make a fresh start today, right now, because God has given us a chance. Did you think about that when you got out of bed this morning? I, I know we thought, well, I'm going to, got to get up. I've got to say my prayers, do my Bible study, and I've got to get ready for church. But did you actually think, God has given me another chance? Well, he has. If we're always looking to the past or always looking to the future, then there's a chance that we might miss the moment that we're in. And we can learn from the past. We should learn from the past. And we should look for the future to plan, but live in the moment. So how do we make the most of today and the days ahead? How can we maintain that excitement, that inspiration that we just received from the Feast of Tabernacles, from the last great day, from, you look at the whole spectrum of God's plan of salvation, from Passover, which wasn't that long ago, which started the plan of salvation of God, the plan of humanity for you and I, all the way through the very close of the last great day, which signifies the very end of the physical plan of God, and it starts the beginning of the spiritual. How can we take this excitement and keep it going throughout this upcoming year? Well, I'm going to share five points with you. Five points to... Maintain, if you will, that Feast of Tabernacle excitement throughout this upcoming year. Now, I will confess that my first point has about seven subpoints. <laughs> they're very quick. They're very they're one word points, <laughs> but just a list. All you have to do is make a list. But the first the first point is walk closely to God. Walk closely with God, I should say. Now we are very blessed to serve a great God, a great God who created all things, including you and I. Just as a reference, you don't have to turn there, but let me, read, let me just share with you Psalms uh, chapter 19. Verse 1, he, and I'm just summarizing, he talks about the heavens cry out that there is a creator God. That's what he's saying in the first couple of verses of Psalms 19. But I would like to go to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 to get started. <clears throat> I 
in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Listen to this. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And guess what? Noah walked with God. Brethren, you and I are called in this world, in our generations, to what? Walk with God. You and I have the very same calling that Noah had. I think that's very, very incredible that God has given you and I the very same thing that he gave all the patriarchs that his word. Noah walked with God. Noah yielded, and he followed, and he sought God's will in his life. And this is what we should be doing. Noah set his priorities in the proper order. Again, this is what we have to be doing in our life. Go to Psalms chapter 51, if you will. Psalms chapter 51, this is a, a prayer of repent, uh, repentance. So if you look at Psalms 51, uh, starting at verse 1, here we see the proper attitude that all of God's people absolutely must have to live a godly life. Psalms 51, starting at verse 1, says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness." Putting God first. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge my transgressions. And there is the key. I acknowledge that we have sinned. And my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Brother, we need to ask ourselves, am I, Kevin, put your name there, am I a person after God's own heart? Am I living this? We've had many conversations this past week and a half uh, here and abroad, as you will, about God knowing the intent of the heart. You and I, brethren, we see fruits of each other. We see the fruits of our action. And that's good. God says you'll know them by their fruits. But he goes a step deeper, and he knows us by our heart. Are we, am I, a person after God's own heart? We have to understand that things will get much worse in the days ahead. In walking with God, we can look at a few ways to help. So I have a few sub-points. <laughs> My first one is daily prayer. Daily prayer. You know, a very good example of this is with David and, and Daniel. Uh, three times a day they did it. You and I, brother, we need to develop a close relationship with God. And the very first way, the, the easiest way, if you will, to do this is on our knees. It's through prayer. It's talk to him. Have a, a personal, a close, a very intimate, if you will, relationship with God and talking to him. Talking to God needs to become second nature in our lives. We should not only go to God only when we need something, and that is appropriate, but we need to go to God and just offer thanks. Be thanking him just for this great calling. Brother, you and I, we are special because he's called us out of this world. He's given us an opportunity now that he hasn't given us world yet. In time, he will. But he had planned this for the foundations of the world. You think he, he didn't think this through? <laughs> yes, he did. So if he's willing to do that for us, what are we willing to do for him? In Psalms, go over to Psalms 100. <clears throat> Psalms 100, we'll look at a few verses here. Verse 1 and 2. It says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, 
all you lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness. Verse 4 says, come before his presence with singing. This is a way to worship God. We should do this. This speaks of a way in which you and I should come before God. I know we, a lot of us, myself included, I couldn't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid. But you know what? That's why he says make a joyful noise. If you're happy about it, it doesn't have to sound good. It, it, and I apologize if I've offended any of you in my trying to sing. But God says make a joyful noise. So it's all about our attitude. Verse 4 here, finishing up here, it says, Enter into the, his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name always. Another sub-point here is Bible study and meditation. Bible study and meditation. You know, we, we talk about this very often in this congregation. That's because it is absolutely so important so important to our spiritual life. This is extremely personal. You know, it's like I had told the brethren down there in my last great day message at the end. You know, I hope I, I see all you every week and continue to see you every week. I may not ever see them down there again, but my thought, and I hope your thought is the same, if we don't see each other again, I hope and I pray that we see each other in the first resurrection. The only way we're going to guarantee this is to draw close to God, is to study and meditate and be a part of his family now and not give up. Sometimes we start to, probably me, I start to sound like a broken record when I stress the importance of study, 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 um, and meditate on God's laws. But when it comes to God's laws, you can't stress this enough. When it comes to understanding God's way of life, we can't stress this enough. And this has to be above anything else that we even care about out in the world. We're in Psalms. Let's go back to Psalms 1. This is one of my favorite Psalms. <coughs> Psalms chapter 1. Starting in verse 1, it said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates it. How often? Day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does, he shall prosper. Being down there in the Caribbean, they're different. And it took us back just a little bit when we went to the first service. Um, well, they're very vocal. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. That's what they do. That's who they are. I don't know how many of the scriptures that I was reading that they finished for me. <laughs> And a lot of them were just reference scriptures. You know, that's, that's how they do things down there. And that's okay. But what that showed me was they study their Bible. They know what the scripture says. And it was obvious that with their fruits that they lived it. And I didn't hear a lot of hallelujahs, but I did hear a lot of finishing scriptures. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's impressive. You know, it's not something we do in the States, but that was impressive. It was different. A number, another point here, attend Sabbath services. Now, these are all basic points, right? Yes, they are. Why? Because it's the basics. It's the basics is what we need to keep us grounded in the path for God's kingdom. Now, I understand at times there is a lot of sickness. There's been a lot going on here. And I've talked to a lot of people who had a lot of sickness at different feast sites. And sometimes um, you can't make it to services. And, and that's understandable. But if we're not contagious, and I know a lot of you will uh, attest to this, you might get up with a headache or, or a backache or something, but 
and you come to church anyway. And you know what? You usually feel better. Why? Well, because you're in God's presence. You're meeting with God's people, with like minds, and that is contagious. That rubs off on each other. That builds each other up. And it's what we need to do. We're all very familiar with what Paul said in Hebrews 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 25. He says, Not forsaking the assembling ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but, then this is where we get the benefit, exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. He's warning us. He's saying, brethren, we need to come together. We need to build unity with each other. He said, because there is a day approaching, we know it's the day of the Lord, that's coming that we don't want to be caught up in, that we don't want to have to face the tribulation. And if we do, we need to be strengthened. If we have to become part of the martyrs, we want to be strengthened. The only way to be strengthened is to meet together, to build that support, to understand God's uh, message. Don't forsake the assembly of each other. And another thing, I'm going back to the Caribbean. We were there seven, eight days, seven for some of us. I don't think I noticed anybody in all those days missing services. There were a few people there coughing. I didn't notice anybody missing services. And again, uh, there, there are legitimate reasons for missing, and that's, that's understandable. But if we don't have a legitimate reason for missing, why are we not going? Is there a place we would rather be than God's services? No. I know we can always call one another on the phone. And we can use some type of social media. That seems to be the thing nowadays. We can interact that way. But brethren, there is absolutely nothing better, nothing at all better than meeting face to face and talking and giving each other a hug. You can't hug over the phone. <laughs> it's tough. You're in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3. Look at this. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3. And this is a, another warning. Paul, you know, he didn't mess around. He, he had a job to do, and he had a, a lot of congregations that were tough. I'm very thankful that God has given me a congregation that is not tough. <laughs> and uh, I thank him every day for that. But Paul said this in Hebrews 3, and verse 13. He said, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. One of the advantages of being together is the very fact that it strengthens us individually. And then it strengthens us collectively as a, a unit, a group. And it helps all of us fight off sin. And we can have success when we do that. <coughs> Excuse me. The next one is um, well, actually, let me. I want to. I want to look at Psalms before I go to the next one. Psalms chapter ninety-five. If you join me there, <clears throat> Psalms ninety-five, and read verse, starting with verse one. This is a call to worship and obedience. That's not one of my points, but that's what this section talks about. Psalms ninety-five, starting with verse one. <clears throat> It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence, how? With thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with song. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the, depth, the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are his or we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. This is the request that he is making for you and I, brethren, to be a part of his service, of his fellowship to be a part of his family. What a great offer. 
Now I'll go to the next sub point. Plan for the holy days. Again, these are all basics. Plan for the holy days. Now it seems like while we're at the feast, well, we start making plans. Where are we going next year? What are we going to do next year? We probably, most of us here, asked that question or was asked of us. What are you doing next year? And that's a lot of fun. And none of us know for sure what this upcoming year's going to hold. Life changes daily. But we are to plan for tomorrow. And it's fun and encouraging to talk about God's holiday plans and his holy days next year. I mean, Debbie and I, we've already talked about Passover. And we're getting ready for that. That'll be here before you know it. I mean, we're thinking it's five, just over five months away. It'll be here. It'll be here before you know it. We should go ahead and start filling our calendar. So I'll give you a date. April 7th is Passover. That evening, <laughs> April 8th, is Passover, but starts the evening before. That's on a Tuesday evening, so don't be late. <clears throat> October the 2nd through the 9th, 2020, is the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, you have to fill in all the rest, but I gave you the two bookends, if you will. Next sub-point, continuous self-examination. Self-examination. Self, you know, why should we not wait for the Passover season to start self-examination? Well, this should be an ongoing process for us. For any true Christian in a true Christian's life, we need to examine ourselves on a daily basis. If we wait until Passover... There's a chance, brethren, there's a chance that we might find out there's something too big for me to fix in one day. You ever think about that? We need to think about this all along the way. We have just over five months. Start doing self-examination now and work on the little things. If we keep them little, then we don't have to worry about a big thing hitting us. You think about our hearts and our minds. You know, we need to continually search our hearts and our minds to make sure that what? We have the heart and the mind of Christ. That's the self-examination that we need to do. You don't have to turn there. Philippians 1, verse 27. It says this. <clears throat> Philippians 1, verse 27 says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. This is personal. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You're known by your fruits. God knows you by your heart. And then one more scripture I want to quote to you is 2 Timothy 2.22. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Flee also youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness faith, love, peace with those who what? Who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's who we're supposed to seek after. That's what we're supposed to seek after. How can we have this kind of heart? Well, we must be very, very diligent, brethren, to search any wicked ways that is in our heart and ask God to remove it quickly and completely. And we can only do this by self-examination on a daily basis. And one last point, <clears throat> sub-point here in point one, is a personal relationship with God. Personal relationship with God. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. <clears throat> Mark chapter 14, starting verse 32. You remember this story? We'll be reading this again here several times between now and Passover. <clears throat> then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. And he had a simple request. What did he say? He said, stay here and watch. 
stay here and watch. He went a little further, and he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And then he said, and this is where he gets very, very personal with God. He says, Abba. He says, Dad. That's what that means. He said, Dad, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. This was a, a cry of sonship, if you will. He had that relationship. And this is a relationship that you and I are to develop with God, with Jesus Christ. We have to work on this. Okay, let's go to point number two. Do we thank God for our brethren? You know, the first point we, we talked about was to walk more closely with God. So the second point is geared towards our fellow brethren. Are we thankful for each other? Do we desire to walk more closely with each other? And I do not, absolutely do not want a show of hands. But is there anybody in your group here that you don't like? That's a personal question. If there is, fix it. <laughs> you have to fix it. I have to fix it. We have to fix it. That's all there is to it. We have to fix it. Are we thankful for each other? You know, brother, the time is approaching when we as Christians, if we are not yet, we will, we will become targets. We'll become targets for a, a wide variety of aggressors. And that time's coming. We're warned about that in God's Word. We will feel very, very lonely if we don't have a proper relationship, first of all, with God, but then with each other. It's going to, get, uh, it's going to be a pretty sad situation if we find ourselves there. It was in the very master plan of God and Jesus Christ to make a supporting family, to create a supporting family. And that family structure is what they started in the very beginning, and that's what they're working on right now, and it's what will be after the last great day is finished in the future and the next part of his plan starts. It's going to still be a family structure. We're reminded of scripture to, or in scripture, not to forget to love one another. It's the second greatest commandment. But if you will join me in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> he gives us a, a couple of final warnings, if you will, in part of his ministry here. As he was closing. In 1 Peter 3, verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you be of one mind. And he says, Have compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, brethren. And that means that, like it or not, we are family. And I hope we all like it. But we are family. And it's a very special family structure that we have here. You know, we all have blood family. <clears throat> but, and I, probably most of you will agree with this. I know we've, we've said this for years and years. But our spiritual family, a lot of times, is much, much closer than our blood family. And it's a great thing. That is no accident. That is part of God's plan. Because long after the physical, the blood family is gone, the spiritual family will continue to remain. First Peter here, chapter 4, verse 8, a chapter, a little uh, chapter deeper, says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another. Where else is Peter? Uh, he, he talks about the, the prayers. And, uh, is the effectual fervent prayer. That's a heartfelt prayer. That's a deep, a deep prayer, a deep want. Above all things, have this deep want, this need, if you will, this love for one another. And he says, for love will cover a multitude of sins. This kind of love, brethren, can be the healing and the mending 
that we all need and we ought to have to survive in this evil world. We ought to have this fervent love for each other. The word fervent here, it means having or displaying a passionate intensity. That's what fervent means, a passionate intensity. Do we have that kind of love for each other? A passionate intensity? You know, by having this kind of love that is required of us, we absolutely can and will go closer to each other in our physical families, our spiritual families. But we have to decide to work to develop this unity that we're talking about here. It's, it's, a, it's a choice. You know, will we choose? This all falls back on self-evaluation. Will we choose to do this? I hope we do. When we adopt this way of life, then we strengthen that bond, that bond of each other, but that bond of peace and that bond of love as God intended. Join me in Psalms 133. <clears throat> Psalms 133. Start in verse 1. <clears throat> Notice what he says here, how he leads right into this. Psalms 133 verse 1 says, Behold, in other words, let me have your attention. He says, Hear me now, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he says, this is what it's like. It's like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down to the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there, is, or for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. You notice how he likens the unity the love that we're supposed to have of the brethren to this precious oil. This oil used in the anointing, the anointing of Aaron. That represents God's Holy Spirit. Not just a, do a drop, a touch, but flowing, running over the beard, over his head. This is very special. I want to share with you a little excerpt from Matthew Henry's commentary on this topic right here. It says this, it is fragrant as the holy anointing oil which was strongly perfumed and diffused its odor to the great delight of all the bystanders. So you can imagine that. If it happened here, everybody would be able to smell it. That's what he's talking about here. When it was poured upon the head of Aaron or his successors, the high priest, so plentiful that it ran down the face even to the collar or the binding of the garment. It is as the dew of Hermon, a common heel, in princes here, for brotherly love is the beauty and the benefit of civil society, for a common heel, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, a holy heel, for it contributes greatly to the fruitfulness of sacred societies. Both Hermon and Zion will with, uh, wither without this dew. While Paul was in prison, he wrote to the brethren in the, the uh, Philippi. And if you go to Philippians chapter 1, we'll look at what he wrote here. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
just as it is right for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Then notice Philippians 4 and verse 1. Philippians 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren. You know how to say, I, I love how he puts this together. My beloved and longed for brethren. Did we long to see each other? Well, we, we, to get back from the feast? We didn't go to the same feast sites? I hope we did. He says, My joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. And finally, Paul reminds us in Colossians 3, you don't have to turn there, Colossians 3, verse 12. He says this, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on the tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, and patience. Let's go to point three. Point three, have our hearts in the work of God. Have our hearts in the work of God. We'll go to John chapter 6 quickly here. And look at a verse. John chapter 6, verse 29. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Now, there's a lot that goes into that, but this is the start. So, this is the work of God, but then we have to take it to the next level. We have to take it to the next level. We have to take it up. That's why we've been studying and praying and taking tests and everything that we've been doing for the last four years, five years, or longer than that, for the last 40, 50 years. This is why we do what we do. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witness to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You understand what he's saying here? But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you're baptized, when hands are laid on you, and you receive God's Spirit... You're a different person. You're changed. And it's not just in Portsmouth, in Peebles, in Seaman, in Cincinnati, wherever you live. He said, in the whole world, you're a changed person. Do we take that to heart? Do we believe? We are to be his witness. That means we are to live an example, an example that shows God is in our life. And we reflect that. And that requires you and I to take action on a daily basis. You know, God's plan to bring many sons to glory is what his intent is, and he will make it happen. And you and I, brethren, are being asked to help right now. Do you realize the power of our calling? We're being asked to help. That's a great thing. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 again. We are to set the example that will cause others to not just want to be a part of the family, but will glorify God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your, God, your good works which glorify which they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation when it gets tough and it will get tough do the right thing that's what he's saying here when the aggressors come and they single us out. Do the right thing. 
do the godly thing, glorify God. Brother, we have to be, continue to be, a light. A light that shines bright in this dark world, a light that represents God in everything that we do. And when we do that, and only when we do that, then we glorify God. Matthew chapter 5, and we're all familiar with this. This is talking about being a light to the world. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 and 16. It says, You are light to the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and then do what? And glorify your Father in heaven. It is absolutely not about glorifying me or you. It's about glorifying God. We're to be that light and we're to be a godly example. Let's look at one more scripture on this point. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But, I, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Brother, it's about God. We know that. But we have to do it. We have to do it. And this brings us to point four, being a servant. Being a servant. You know, nothing opens the doors of possibilities wider or promotes a positive attitude better than when you and I begin with a servant's heart. When we are looking for ways to help others, God will absolutely miraculously provide ample opportunity for us to do just that. And those possibilities are always there. We just need to look for them. Go to Matthew chapter 25. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25. Start in verse 34. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit. Verse 40. Then the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. This is the very act of serving others. Serving others, whatever the need might be. Sometimes it's a phone call. Sometimes it's a visit. Sometimes it's a meal. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's a, a shirt, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. Serving doesn't require you and I to be talented. Did you know that? We don't have to be a special breed of whatever. We don't have to have talent. We don't have to be wealthy, and we don't even have to be gifted. It only requires that you and I show the character of Jesus Christ. That's what it requires. Another related and favorite verse of mine here, and you don't have to turn there, but it's Hebrews 13, verse 2. And I like this verse. It says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. That's interesting, isn't it? How many angels have we entertained? We don't know. Maybe one day we'll find out. It doesn't make you want to Rethink, <laughs> how do I treat that person? I don't know that person. How do I treat them? 
When we have the opportunity to serve others, brethren, we absolutely must take advantage of that opportunity. And we must do it to the best of our ability, whatever that is. And all of our abilities are different, and that's fine. That's how God calls us. But we have to be able to act on that and do the best we can. Let's continue to be servants. We have to remember that the example of Christ, he said that he came to serve and not be served. That has to be our philosophy. That has to be our example. Brother, we have the one product that this world needs, and that's true happiness. That's godly truth. It's the plan of God, the very work of God. We have that. This world needs it. They'll get it one day. But right now, you and I have that. In short, brethren, we have the godly hope. This world doesn't have it yet, but one day they will. And this takes me to point number five. Be all you can be. Be all you can be. No, no, I, I'm not recruiting for the army. <laughs> At least not the army of the world. I am recruiting for the army of God. So we know that military slogan. It was an advertising campaign that the army used for years. And maybe they still use I don't know. But we have to give our very best after everything we do. We read that scripture already. But let me share just a few verses here that gives me encouragement, anyway, to try to make the best of everything. And I hope it does you. It's Ephesians chapter 5 is a good place to start. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 and 16. It says, be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Paul is sharing this with us so that we, brethren, we can absolutely make the most of every opportunity, the most to live our life according to Christ, and that... He might shine through us. And that one person that might be the most unaware to us may see that and may be turned to God. We don't have a clue how many more people God's going to call before Christ returns. But we do know our job in the future will be to help teach people, help bring them into the knowledge of Christ. Do you not believe that that is our job today? Yes, it is. We don't know who we're going to come in contact with, but the thing about the, the fact of the matter is, we should be doing that now. We have to be doing that now. Here's two verses in Colossians. I want to look at Colossians three and verse seventeen. It says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then I'll down a couple of verses in uh, verse 23, Colossians 3, verse 23. We looked at this already. Whatever you do, work at it with all your hearts as working for the Lord, not for men. It's about getting our priorities straight. Putting them where they need to be. If we want to get the best from every possibility, then we have to give the best in all of our efforts, whatever that might be. There's an expression, and I've heard this in the past. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. It's called, a faint heart never won fair lady. Have you ever, anybody ever heard that expression before? A couple of you have. A faint heart never won a fair lady. And what it means, to, to break that down, it simply means for you and I, brother, personally, to take our game, our prize or our reward, if you will, we should, if possible, never lose sight of the chase. If you want to get the prize, don't lose sight of the chase. Is that not what we're doing here? We know what the prize is. The reward is the kingdom of God. If we want to get the reward, don't lose sight of this chase. Philippians says, don't grow weary, or Galatians, don't grow weary in well-doing. 
That's what it's saying here. In other words, go at it, whatever it might be, with absolutely everything that we have, everything that we can muster. Give it your best. And that's the very example that God set. It's the very example that Christ said. They gave it their best. There's a few scriptures in Psalms that kind of help summarize everything we've talked about today. So let's notice just a few of these as we start to wind down. Psalms chapter 103. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 103, we'll read the first five verses here. <clears throat> now verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. But you notice here that this is what he does for you and I, for his people. And then he goes on, says, Who forgives all your iniquities. He forgives all your iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. He completely, brethren, completely takes care of us in absolutely everything. Everything that we need. It might not be everything that we want, but everything that we need. How encouraging is that? Well, let's conclude in Psalms 138. <clears throat> Psalms 138, starting in verse 1. This section here can be summarized by grateful praise, if you will. The first five verses in 6 through 8 talks about God's care for his people, for you and I. Psalms 138, starting in verse 1. It says, I will praise you <clears throat> with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praise to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. Yes, they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord is on high, yet he regards the lowly, but the proud he knows from afar, <coughs> separates himself. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercies, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Brother, the Psalms here helps us. Helps us have an attitude. An attitude of Abba. As Jesus cried out, Abba, Father. Which means this is a close personal relationship with our Heavenly Dad. This is what this helps us have. And when we start to have a deeper understanding of God's word and God's way of life, and we start to live it even on a deeper basis than we are right now, we can be stronger in facing whatever the days, the weeks, the months, the years have in store for us. Whatever is there, we can make it through. And through God, we can have the strength and the courage that we need to cover everything, to get through. So, brethren, let's buckle down and let's commit our lives to God. And I hope and ask that we do it in a way that we've never done before. The points that we looked at here today, they only scratch the surface of living a true life as a real, a true godly Christian. But we can continue, we need to continue to be encouraged. And be enthusiastic for this godly life that we have been blessed to be called into and be a part of.
and have this great opportunity to share this life with as many others that will listen. So in the days and the weeks and the months ahead, brethren, let's keep the fire burning.